and access. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing you might want to put on is a live transcription. So is it showing up? Yeah, yeah. well, it says it is. <laughs> yeah, and then I think the person has to click, click on it also. I'll try this. Okay. Okay, now if somebody talks, I can see if I see talking. Anne, tell me oh. something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lovely morning and it's not raining yet. Okay, yeah, it shows up as uh, subtitles right now because that's what I clicked on. Okay, good. If anyone wants live transcript, that person probably knows that. I never saw that. Oh, it's great. Um, My brother I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure it's gonna rain because I did some watering yesterday. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm holding off. I'm washing my car. <laughs> <laughs> my brother is profoundly deaf. So on family Zooms, we have to use that. And once we all found it, ah. it's been able to access everything. So it's a really useful tool for those who need it. I really like it when we watch anything, any movies on uh, our TV, because especially if they're English. Yeah. Isn't that true? It's really, it is great. I understand what they're saying. <laughs> so oh. I do like that. So Pam, I don't know whether this is intentional, but um, you've changed your position with your computer and you yeah. have the light behind you so we can't see you. So I'm thinking it could be on purpose or not. <laughs> Let me just see if I move here or maybe it'll get a little better. Yeah, if there's light in the background. It... Yeah, I know what it is. I had to move my computer. Oh, that's... I mean, my, my let's see. Maybe this will be better. <laughs> well, so far it's not working real well, Pam. We don't see you at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, some people like a loose, they block off the whole picture. <laughs> That's a little better, maybe. There. It is better. Thank you. Pam, if you look like me, behind? you'd block yourself off. <laughs> Pam, are there curtains behind you that can be shut? No, no. Right, right behind your head. Looks like there are, but no. Okay. No, there's no no um, shutter on that. Oops. Well, it's ten oh three now, so let's formally start. Uh, I'm Delight Willing. I'm the co-chair of the Bainbridge Unit. And my other co-chair, as I think some of you heard, is Colette Crosby. She has gone on not quite an emergency run, but her brother has just had major heart surgery and decided that she had to be with him today rather than with us. Though I think when she gets there, if it's accessible, she's going to try to tune in. So she may join us, she may not. Uh, I'm really happy to introduce Kat Freienberg, if I'm saying that right, Kat. Kat is the first vice president of our Kitsap uh, County Unit or, or group and has been spending a lot of her time on this open meetings. So Kat, I turn it over to you. And of course my phone starts ringing. <laughs> um, hold on just one. That reminded me to mute my phone right now. Yeah, I was going to ask that. It's the other phone that's always the one that's the kicker. It's the when it's, you've got a landline you don't use very often and then it decides that now's the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. I don't even know that, what the number for that my phone never on. rings. It never <laughs> rings. <laughs> um, yes, I'm Catherine Freudenberg. Um, I'm the second VP. I'm the I'm the spare. <laughs> um, I was I was uh, asked to participate in a team uh, that was formed uh, to work on a particular project, which is the OPMA. Uh, you know what is OPMA. And I believe that the DEI committee uh, began discussing this after watching the redistricting um, events and how that, you know, didn't really go as planned. And, and there were a lot of concerns about uh, conversations not being held in public. So as we started discussing this, we thought the first place to start is to provide members with an overview of what OPMA is, how it should work, 
so that they understand, you know, the little subtleties in the law. And this isn't intended to answer every question. So there may be questions afterwards and I'll do my best to answer those or at least take them down and get answers for you. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to start our PowerPoint. Can everybody see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this PowerPoint is going, it's automated. So I'm going to start it and then we'll do Q and A at the end of it. Open Public Meetings Act, also known as OPMA. This is an overview of Washington State's Open Public Meetings Act. The purpose of this training is to provide a high level overview of the Open Public Meetings Act, also known as OPMA. This training is comprised of two parts, a PowerPoint slide deck and a video from Washington State's Attorney General. We recommend members view the slide deck prior to viewing the video. This training is not intended as legal advice, but an educational tool for members to help explain the elements of OPMA. The slide deck includes links to the related RCW and additional training resources on OPMA, the Sunshine Laws, including Open Public Records Act and the Model Rules of Public Disclosure. We encourage members to review the other materials provided. Municipalities, counties, school boards, and other entities may also have their own rules and procedures that guide entity-specific processes, so it is important to review those as well. Washington State Attorney General says government accountability means that public officials elected and unelected have an obligation to explain their decisions and actions to the citizens. Government accountability is achieved through the use of a variety of mechanisms, political, legal, and administrative, designed to prevent corruption and ensure that public officials remain answerable and accessible to the people they serve. In the absence of such mechanisms, corruption may thrive. Strong sunshine laws are crucial to assuring government accountability and transparency. In Washington state, those laws provide for open public records and open public meetings. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Washington sunshine laws include Open Public Meetings Act at RCW 42.30 and Open Public Records Act at RCW 42.56. The laws are based on three important principles. The people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for the people to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may maintain control over the instruments that they have created. Open Public Meetings Act, RCW 42.30, created to provide public view of the decision-making process. It applies to public agencies such as public commissions, boards, and councils. Washington Attorney General's Office requires meetings to be open gavel to gavel. A meeting of the governing body could occur when a majority of members, also known as a quorum, gathers with the collective intent of transacting the governing body's business. State law recognizes two types of meetings, regular or special. Regular meetings have predefined schedule that is published each year. Special meetings are scheduled on an as needed basis and require 24 hours notice to include date, time, and purpose. The purpose cannot change and is predefined when the meeting is called. The 24 hour notification may be waived if the special meeting is because of an emergency 
typically fire, flood, or some emergency where time is of the essence to act. Meetings labeled as study sessions will be either regular or special meetings. A council may combine regular business with a study session. The agenda should clearly define the purpose of the meeting. Executive sessions and closed sessions. Executive session is defined in RCW 42.30.110. They can be part of a regular meeting or scheduled as a separate special meeting. They are limited to certain discussions. Some examples are pending litigation, a public employee's performance review, or purchase of real estate. For a complete list as to what is permitted to be discussed during executive session, consult RCW 42.30.110. Discussion is closed to public attendance, but any action arising from this type of meeting must be conducted in public view. Action may be taken after the executive session, such as voting, motions, instructing staff activities, etc. Executive sessions that pertain to litigation must have an attorney present. Closed sessions are similar in that they are used to discuss bargained for workforce contracts. These meetings are separate from recognized executive sessions but are also closed to the public. Here are some examples of potential OPMA pitfalls. Informal meetings can occur when a quorum is present and begins discussing or transacting business. Email communications. It does not require that all included on email participate in the exchange. They could be silent but still be in violation. Group phone calls where a quorum is present or a phone tree, where members are called individually to discuss and determine future action. Straw polls or deciding a vote while in executive session. Social media discussions when a quorum is present. Meeting via Zoom or Google outside of public view when a quorum is present. An informal gathering in the parking lot at an event where business is discussed or transacted. Electronic communications outside of public view while conducting a public meeting. Council members should not communicate via text or chat during public meetings. OPMA violators may incur penalty sanctions or both. It's $500 for the first offense, $1,000 for each subsequent offense, and that is personal liability for the electee. Court will award attorney fees to the party seeking remedy. Action taken at a meeting can be declared null and void under RCW 42.30.120, RCW 42.30.130, and RCW 42.30.060. Here we'll review a recent OPMA violation involving the Washington State Redistricting Commission. The information contained on this slide and the next slide comes from the consent decree and final judgment. In December of 2021, Washington State Coalition for Open Governments, also known as WashCog, sued the state of Washington, the Washington State Redistricting Commission, and the five commissioners. Multiple violations were cited. Training, insufficient OPMA training as required by law under RCW 42.30.205. Open meetings violations. Voting in private, failure to make the plan and maps available to the public prior to voting, failure to hold a public hearing. The commissioners held discussions out of public view, held serial meetings when they met over a two day period where they communicated with staff and each other. The Open Public Meetings Act provides no governing body of the public agency shall adopt any ordinance, resolution, rule, regulation, order, or directive, except in a meeting open to the public. No governing body of a public agency at any meeting required to be open to the public shall vote by secret ballot. 
OPMA requires any substantive discussion or deliberations on commission business to occur in open public meetings. Washcog and the state of Washington reached a settlement. Elements of the agreement include the following. The Open Public Meetings Act, OPMA, applies to the commission and its commissioners. The commission and its commissioners violated OPMA and the commission's corresponding rules regarding transparency. A commitment to implement rules so that the commissioners no longer negotiate in private. A stipulation that all future commissioners and staff shall complete open government training within 30 days of hiring or appointment. Before the commission considers any motion to approve a final redistricting plan, the commission shall make that plan publicly available, including any proposed congressional or legislative district maps. The commission shall open for public comment any motion to approve a final plan prior to voting on the motion. Penalties of $500 per commissioner and payment of legal costs and fees for the plaintiffs. Penalties totaled $2,500 split between Washcog and another plaintiff, Arthur West, who filed his own suit. Also awarded was $106,743 in attorney fees and $13,428 and 78 cents for other costs. The consent decree and final judgment can be found at this link for further review. Here are some examples of historical OPMA cases. This information comes from the Municipal Research and Services Center, also known as the MRSC website. The purpose of OPMA is to permit the public to observe all steps in the making of government decisions. Cathcart versus Anderson. When does a committee or a governing body act on behalf of the governing body? Citizens Alliance for Property Rights Legal Fund versus San Juan County. The OPMA applies to Washington Association of County Officials. West versus Washington Association of County Officials. The OPMA applies to a quorum of members attending a meeting not called by their governing body only if action is taken. This is Attorney General Office 2006, number six. Meetings subject to the OPMA can occur over email. Wood versus Battleground School District. Okay. Emergency must be a severe one. Mead School District number 354 versus Mead Education Association. Ratification of invalid act is null and void. Clark versus City of Lakewood. The links are active in this slide so you can review the lawsuits um, at your leisure. On this slide we've provided additional resources uh, that review in greater depth the Washington State Sunshine Laws. That includes Open Public Meetings Act and Open Public Records Act. The yellow highlight is the recommended video uh, to view following this presentation. We hope that you have found this information helpful and we thank you for your time. So everybody got all of that and. <laughs> where, where can one access this slide uh, set? Um, so the slide presentation should go out to all members and er, anywhere where you saw a line in that presentation is an active link either to the law or a lawsuit or uh, like the redistricting commissions. Um, the cases against that were filed against them and besides the the two cases referenced, there were additional cases that were filed and I believe are, there's a couple that are still pending. Um, and so uh, when you're looking at uh, the sunshine laws, these are the tools that the people have available to them to hold the elected folks accountable. 
And, you know, trust me when I say that's easier said than done. <laughs> uh, but, you know, many times when you observe a meeting, you'll see something and you'll think, well, that's strange, you know? So this is a, provide some foundational information. And then as I mentioned, it's also important to look at the rules of the body, right? So if it's a local council, they'll also have rules that pertain to the council members, what's acceptable, how the meetings are structured. So I also tell people to take a look at that. Um, but I always start with, you know, if I observe something, you know, pointing it out to the elected person or the group and say, hey, I observed this, you know, I don't understand. And, and here's why I think there's a problem and give them the benefit of the doubt because they are our neighbors. In some cases, they're our friends and they've stepped up to take on a public office. And I don't, no matter how popular they are, they're gonna make somebody angry. <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast. Um, and so, you know, I always assume that perhaps it's just an oversight or a mistake. Um, I had the opportunity to watch a new group of uh, council members and they had the, they were unlucky enough to, to be put on a board where they, the board had just lost five members. So you virtually have a brand new council with the exception of a couple of members. Most of the staff was, was new. And so you could see when the meeting started, they weren't certain. And there were some trip ups and mistakes and, and you know, doing some gentle nudging and letting people know that's not really how it's supposed to work. Um, you know, it's just helpful to them and they were very appreciative. Uh, so it's a lot of it, you know, the RCWs, um, I found that I had to read them a few times to really understand. And, and there's still new things that pop up. You know, what's of interest to me today, tomorrow I might have a whole different concern and I'm back in there researching. Um, so hopefully these links will help you if you have questions or you see something like, is this advisory committee held to the same standards? Um, you know, can the mayor do this, right? You know, you're gonna have these questions sometimes when you watch a meeting. Hopefully this gives you the sources of where you can go to get some of those answers. And I'm always happy to help. I, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent researching. So if there's something I can help with, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Whose responsibility is it for uh, a new person going on any kind of council to be informed of this more, you know, more specifically? The, the city, if it's a city council member, for example, it's the body, um, the organization. Uh, there's a state law that says that they have 90 days to be trained and there are training courses available. And so that should be part of their onboarding process, just like giving them their, their you know, board email address or it's all part of that package. What I found though, um, that's interesting is that by law, they're also required to be retrained after four years. So if you have a body that is very stable and people are reelected multiple times, the question comes up, you know, are they being retrained? And I have not been able to find anyone that tracks that. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't something that tracks it. I just haven't found it. And so uh, the reason that's important is that because it's law, it changes. Um, this year, there were new changes to the law that were implemented, which was why we recommended viewing that latest video. Um, it's like anything, a lawsuit happens. Uh, there's, if you, you know, Google um, city sued, you'll find, you know, numerous lawsuits across the country for things like, you know, the overuse of redaction. Uh, you know, they have a right to redact certain things in a message, you know, that might be somebody's social security number, 
or their home address, but they don't necessarily get to block out the entire message unless it's like attorney client privilege, right? So, Maury. Um, speaking to you direct, you know, coincidentally, um, could you write up a little article about this presentation and uh, recommendations and uh, provide the links to not only this presentation, but also the video that you've been referring to? Is that that's available somewhere? Yes, I'm assuming. yes that's on the AG's website. Yeah. And so I think this is enough to, to be an article rather than just a, a part of Delight's and Colette's monthly report thing. Okay, sure. And what I will do, I just took a screenshot of the, you know, so that might be a picture we can use in the article. <laughs> That's all. Uh, and it's very good. Very good. Uh, I enjoy it. Um, and well, um, I was just going to say that you were asking who's responsible for it. I think many of, and probably most, if not all, of the state associations also provide training and usually within 90 days, I mean, I think it is almost always within 90 days of the election when a group is elected, whether it's a city council or whatever, whatever school boards do, well, Catherine will know, but school boards do the same thing. I mean, so the state associations, tend to always have a training for onboarding people that are new or are having to renew after having been having served for four years. And, and that's something just to keep track of and know for anybody going on to a new board that they can look to that state association to have a training that includes the Open Public Meetings Act information. Yeah, and, and the public can also view the same yes. training. Which oh, right, is, absolutely. I, I watch uh, their training videos, and I have to say the AG's video is is a little lighter than the the official training videos. They're pretty long, um, and I didn't... They just, excuse me, do they use videos rather than have an in-person meeting? I mean, oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Well, I suppose that's a COVID deal. Well, the in-person ones that I was familiar with from some time back um, were really incredibly important to me and very helpful when that those things came up. So, okay, I didn't realize they were all videos now. Carolyn? Hi, thank you, first Hi. off. Um, that was great, great info. And I feel like I, I just need to keep hearing some of this to absorb yes. So one of the things I try to understand is like with city council and they appoint a, a commission, the committee, let's say of, of citizens, at what point do the OPMA laws come into play? Is it only if they make some sort of decision or, or I mean, I, I, that's where I'm fuzzy on. Yeah. It, it, so there's this question of, you know, what rules apply to like advisory boards mm -hmm. and they do, they, you know, they are held to the same public records um, rules. There are variations depending on the type of activities they're involved in. So you'd almost have to take, you know, that particular board and, and take a look at it and find out what what work are they doing? Are they just gathering information, but making no decisions on that and presenting that to the council where the actual decisions are made, almost like a staff function? Uh -huh. um, it still falls under public records, but there may be more leeway as to, you know, the activities that they're doing um, uh -huh. outside of the public eye. You know, okay. it, the key thing is they can't be making decisions. Okay, I think that's, that's the key. That's... Um, I, it was interesting that AG's office has a group called the Sunshine Committee, and it was Jeannie Allen that, you know, she she headed up this project, and she made us aware of the, the Sunshine Committee, which I hadn't heard of, and I have been listening in on some of their meetings, and they're quite interesting, and they debate different topics. But it was mentioned during one of those meetings, in talking about um, committees and how the public views the committees. And when they go away, sometimes the public feels as though they've lost something. Like it's another layer 
um, mm. of government that gives them more of a voice or um, just additional people sort of holding the, the council accountable, for example. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really considered that, but it was interesting, you know, yeah. to hear that topic. Thank you. Delight. Okay. Here we are talking about them, the elected officials, or perhaps the unelected appointed people to committees. I want to talk about us. Uh, years ago, when Anne had just been elected to the City Council of Bainbridge Island, uh, and we were friends, I sent her an email saying, shall we go for a walk tomorrow? And by the way, I didn't like that decision last night at City Council. Immediately, I got an email back from her saying, never email me anything about city business to my personal email, use only my city email, and I am forwarding this to my uh, city account immediately. I didn't know that. And I don't know if some of you deal with city council members or other elected officials. You, I, I now know you must always use their official accounts for anything dealing with any kind of official or unofficial, any kind of city or county or state business. And anything you put into writing or even leave a voicemail message for them, assume that that will become a public record. So um, don't call, call them up and yell at them because, <laughs> because somebody like me will request a public record and, and the transcript of that call will be in there. It's, uh, it's been an eye-opening experience. And, I, and like most people, I would watch my council meetings. I'd look at the agendas. And, you know, typically what would happen is there'd be something on there that would get my attention. Uh, and they usually it was a public hearing, right? They're gonna have a public hearing mm -hmm. because of this building that's going in. And that's when I started to learn that by the time it gets to the public hearing, the decision's pretty much made. And so you wanna be involved much further in the, the process, much earlier. Um, and not wait until that point. But when it starts to affect you, you really start to pay attention to how the meetings operate. And that's when a lot of my questions started to come about. Any other questions? People comfortable requesting public records? That's another part of open government that's very important. Catherine, I think you're on mute. <laughs> um, it's interesting because way back when, when I was on the school board, um, people, sometimes a teacher, sometimes a parent, would call me on my personal um, yeah. phone because they did not, they were afraid that they would be disciplined. <laughs> if it went out on the public um, email or I mean, when I started, we didn't even have email, but um, I would take those calls and I would listen to their concern. Now we all had a commitment that if it was a personnel concern, we would take that to the superintendent for him to address without giving the name of the person who had brought this up to me. Was I violating the Open Meetings Act? I mean, it was different back then because again, we didn't have necessarily have emails. No, you're, that, I wouldn't call that a violation of Open Meetings Act, but if somebody requested a public record, you would be obligated to turn that over, even oh, yeah. if it's on your yeah. personal device. Um, and that seems to be where where electees get sort of tripped up. Um, they get copied on an email and they didn't start the email. They're not even participating in the email, but they are now part of a group and in some cases a quorum, <laughs> at which time they've then violated the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, so it's important that those messages, A, that they, they not do that. <laughs> um, but those messages also need to go to their official email addresses. Carolyn. I'm just wondering for the upcoming, oh, for the upcoming forums, um, you have this expertise and we have a group present right now. I'm just wondering what question regarding OPMA might be appropriate for candidates. That's a good question. I'll have to give that one some thought. Um, 
but I think anything about open government might be a good question. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love to have it on there. I just don't know what form. We could ask every candidate, have you participated in uh, OPMA training within the, you know, whatever time period? That would but be our yeah. yes, no it's question. After, it's after the election. It's within 90 days after the election, I believe. Oh, yeah, right. that's right. That's right. Carolyn Simmers. Catherine and Robin, let's think about that. Uh, thank you. So I've submitted quite a few FOIAs over the last few years. <laughs> and, and it seems like there is no actual legal definition of time frame in which they need to get you that information. Yeah, what do you know about that? it's the time frame is a little ambiguous. Um, so the courts say reasonable. And in reading, because I've actually had the experience where I've put in public records requests and noticed that a city does an automatic 30 day and sometimes we'll split it into small batches, particularly if it's stuff that maybe they're not thrilled about <laughs> turning over and they kind of drag it out. But I have seen lawsuits where that was mentioned. Um, case in point, Delight just sent uh, an article from 2000 and a settlement for Bainbridge, right? 2014 uh, was the date of the article, but it went all the way back to 2011. And in reading the judge's comments, there were, um, you know, the judge noticed that there were, was a, a very long timeline to get the request. Um, it, I, so I guess the answer would be, it depends. You know, mm. if it's an electronic, if it's an electronic record and it's in existence, and it's a matter of them putting in a, a search string, pulling those records up, um, they'll have to, more than likely, they may have their attorney review those before they get released. But, you know, that timeline shouldn't be six months. Now, if you asked for, you know, a request that's going to produce 250,000 records, then that's going to take longer because somebody's got to review those records before they get released. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. 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 Um, so I sent a FOIA, I've been sent several FOIAs into the Department of Health regarding a certificate, certificate of need uh, reports for, and they, they say it's gonna take four months and honest to goodness, it's on the last day of that fourth month that I actually get that report and there's been no redactions at all. It's just like they're dragging their feet. Oh yeah, and that's, yeah. I would, I mean, personally, I would look and see What's the volume of record requests they're getting? You know, do they have a, a reason why they're super busy? And I might send a note to the, the legal, you know, whoever their attorney is or their legal advice and say, hey, you know, this is consistent. Every time I put one in, it's four months. And here's what the RCW says. <laughs> Chances are they'll think they'll, they might thank you for your comment and they're not going to respond to you, but you hope that there's an internal conversation that goes on. And you have Well, my, my observation, and, and again, unfortunately it, it's old, so I don't know that it's current enough to be worthy of much, but at many places, and, and I would say this is true about the county government as well as at least one city that I know of, had internal policies about the time of response. And what I'm recalling is that a letter or a note, whatever, an email went back to the requesting party saying, you know, it's we have we our process is to give it to you within whatever the time frame was, 10 days. I mean, it was something that was established as a policy within that particular governing body. And then if there was if it was going to take longer than that. There, the letter went back and said, we got your request and it's going to take us four months to get it to you. And, and I don't recall that they were required to provide a reason, but there certainly wasn't just an ignoring it. I mean, I think it might be worth checking and I don't, it, it certainly doesn't say anything in the law. I don't think about having to have that, but perhaps working with different jurisdictions, you may want to see if they, that isn't something that could be 
included as just a policy so that people aren't left, as Carolyn said, for four months. I mean, that's that's just that's like not getting it, in my personal opinion. But so there, there's a couple of things. Um, they okay. have to respond within five days. Five days. That's what I recall. of receipt of the request. And their policy for handling public records should be written. It should be mm -hmm. published. Somewhere. Absolutely. So that's a, a good place to start and say, are they even following their own policy? Well, and that's what I, and does everyone have the same five? I mean, I remembered that from yeah. the two groups that I yeah. worked with. Yeah, but I'm getting does everyone say five days. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been extremely informative, and I look forward to your article in the voter. Uh, it'll be good to have the link to the attorney general's video. And Betty, did you have a question or should I turn this over to you?